I am a, a researcher at the California Academy of Sciences and I do lots of different things. But today I'm gonna to be talking about some work that I do on, on owls. Um, and I've really only been doing this for a relatively short amount of time, just for maybe 10, 15 years or so. Um, and I'm gonna summarize some of that because I think it's really interesting stuff. And um, not just because of the research that's being done, but because I think it's gonna be a really important watershed case. And, and, I'm, and I'm hoping um, as I tell this story and as it unfolds for you, I, I'm hoping that you'll begin to think really differently about what conservation priorities are and, and how we address some of the conservation priorities and what it means to be an animal lover and a conservationist. Because um, I think that these are challenging times for us. Um, so I'm going to be talking about owls and in, in particular, um, I'm going to be talking about the Northern Spotted Owl. And this is, this is our buddy, the Northern Spotted Owl. And I'm here in forests that, you know, that hosts these guys. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly common owl here in Marin County, but not so much further north. Um, it's a medium sized forest owl. Uh, it's chocolate brown with spotting on the head and neck, back and under parts. Like most raptors, the male is a little bit smaller than the female. Um, and this particular species is restric restricted to areas with large, thick forests, mostly older stands. Um, and the, the owls usually roost in cool, shady spots, often near the streams or on the lower third of the slopes. And they have huge home ranges, um, often up to 2,500 hectares. Um, or actually, that's um, 2,500 acres. It's, um, it can be as much as um, 6,000, or no, 6,000 acres, 2,500 hectares. Um, and we often don't see them because they're active at night, but you do hear their call. And their most, their most common call is a four note hoot that sort of just goes, ooh, 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 ooh. And so that's one of the main ways that you'll recognize that they're in the forest and hear them. So the Northern Spotted Owl is split up into three different subspecies. Uh, the Northern Spotted Owl, um, which is found here from British Columbia down through uh, Washington, Oregon, and then along the coast ranges in Northern California. And then the California Spotted Owl is genetically distinct from Northern Spotted Owl. And it's found um, from the Northern Sierras down the, down the spine of the Sierras uh, into the, some of the sky islands in the, in the desert of Southern California, and then up along the coast ranges, um, almost uh, up to Monterey Bay uh, or, and, and up to uh, and, and into Santa Cruz area. The third subspecies is the Mexican spotted owl, and it's found in the desert southwest and down into Mexico. Now, um, northern spotted owl forages mostly at night, like most owls do. They're sitting wet, wet predators, and and you know if you've ever spent much time out in the in the redwood forest here, you know that they're very very quiet, and they'll sit up on a perch, and they'll listen for for movement, um, and then they'll fly down. Most of their diet. Um, by most accounts, over 90% of the diet is small rodents. And this is composed mostly of dusky-footed wood rats in the south, and then northern flying squirrels as you go north will replace the dusky-footed wood rats. Um, but they do take other small mammals and even birds and um, some insects from time to time. But again, 90 to 95% of their diet is small mammals, and that's composed mostly of these two species. Um, now, a little bit of history. Um, most of you are probably aware that these owls are protected, especially the northern spotted owl, um, and that they were listed uh, in 1990 because of population declines and also because of destruction of critical habitat. Now, just an idea when first listed, um, we were seeing these, these pretty big declines. And so a biologist pulled together and did a lot of demographic studies to try and measure this decline and try and understand it. And one of, the, one of the key parameters they use is something called the annual rate of population change, or lambda. Now, lambda is a parameter that when lambda equals one, it means the population is not growing, it's stable. And then anything above one, you can think of as like interest on your bank account, okay? And it'll accrue um, each year at, just in the same way that interest does. Anything below one, the difference between one and that number is, is like eating into the capital. So for example, Here's a couple of lambdas um, that they measured across the range. And so the best performing populations had lambda of about 0.984, which meant that each year about 1.6% of the population, or the capital, if you will, was, was disappearing. And so the populations were declining at that rate, about 1.6% per year. Some of the worst performing populations were losing almost 20% of the population per year. Now, just to put this into perspective and what this means, so again, this was in 1990, they had these numbers. 
And this is here um, years along the x-axis and population size along the y-axis. And if you just think of a population that has 100 individuals, so you can think easily in terms of percentage, over 30 years time, um, those, those poorly performing populations would almost certainly be extinct after 30 years. And even the best performing populations are down to about 60% of what you started with. The range-wide average in 1990 um, was looking at like something in this range, which meant in 30 years, they would be down to 30% of the population. And this was fairly alarming to them at the time, and one of the reasons why um, the populations were listed. Now, at the time of the listing, um, the, the major reasons were because of, of the decline, but also because of habitat loss. Uh, so there, there was a big concern about habitat loss, especially the old growth forests in the Northwest, which were declining mostly because of, of logging. Now, under the Endangered Species Act, every species is supposed to be reviewed every five years um, to see if they still belong on the list or not. Um, and in reality, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has never had the capacity to deal with every species that gets listed and do a full review of each. And so in order to get a review, you have to basically sue the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so this happened in around 2003 um, because industry brought a lawsuit challenging the list listing one, because populations were declining in spite of the Northwest Forest Plan and halted logging. So they said, clearly it's not working. Um, that might seem like twisted logic to some of us, but, but again, that was, that was one of the reasons why um, the lawsuit was brought. The other one was because there was some genetic data um, that had been published in the intervening years, which questioned whether or not the Northern Spotted Owl was actually a valid subspecies. And so a, a five-year status review was initiated in 2003. And that's when I got pulled into it. And I'm, I, especially at the time, was more of a geneticist by training. And so I was asked to join a panel of about 10 to 15 different biologists who were looking at all different aspects of the listing and of the owl and how they were doing. And I was brought in as a, as a geneticist to look at the genetic data. But we all reviewed each other's data. They reviewed mine and helped me write my sections and I reviewed all of theirs. And so at the end, it was a really powerful um, review and a really nice um, paper that came out. So at that time, this is what some of the demographic data looked like. So again, um, they looked at um, the different 13 study areas that they had good data on. And 12 of the 13 study areas had declining populations. And even that last one um, was, was close to declining, but it, you know, the, the confidence interval was large enough that they couldn't be absolutely sure. The it's mean a, lambda, yeah? Just for clarification, we had, is this the period between 1985 and 2003, like on the screen? Or you had a question here, what was the 30 year decline period? Uh, that's just a hypothetical, the 30 year decline, because I think it's hard for people to understand. They're like, oh, well, it's only losing 1.6% of the population. That doesn't seem like a lot, does it? But again, if you think about your bank account and if you're losing that much of your capital, um, it declines pretty rapidly over 30 years. Um, and remember, um, you know, right now um, we're hitting 2020, and so we're looking at that 30-year period between 1990 when the owls were first listed to today. So that's kind of why I chose that 30-year that period to look at. Um, but projecting, you know, forward, um, I just wanted to, to mention that, so at that point and in 2003, um, they reevaluated the demographic data, and the mean for the eight Northwest Forest Plan areas was about 0.976. So it was actually even lower than some of the earlier estimates. Um, and some of the worst performing ones, um, or I, I should say that the non-Northwest Forest Plan areas had a much lower mean of about, of about 0.942. So again, you know, these numbers are hard to wrap your mind around, but one way to do that is to show it on this sort of hypothetical graph. So let's say that these are the new, the, the new numbers. So, you know, based on a listing of around 1990 or so, um, you can expect these kinds of numbers over time. So that means that, you know, by 2020, um, those, those areas that are not in the Northwest Forest Plan would have about 20% of what they started with. And even those best performing areas um, would be well under 50% of what they started with by now. Okay, so, so these, are, these are big losses. And it's suggesting that, you know, even with the forest protection, um, that these owls are still in deep, deep decline and trouble. So one of the other factors that was brought up in that 2003 meeting, and this paper had just come out in the Condor by Kelly et al., 
and they were looking at the number of barred owl territories. And as you can see in this, this map, the, the cumulative number of barred owl territories was growing exponentially. And each year, the new numbers that were being added were, were growing and, and were quite high by 1990. And so they were suggesting um, that barred owls may be a threat to spotted owls. And so we on that panel considered that um, the other data that people had was data that looked like this. Um, this is what northern spotted owl populations were looking like, and this is what um, the barred owl populations were looking like. And so we were seeing this really interesting, um, this pattern where barred owls were moving in and spotted owls were in decline. But, one of the, but what we didn't know at that time was what was the cause, what was the cause and what was effect, because it, it could be that spotted owls were going extinct for some other reason and barred owls were moving in to fill in those empty spaces. On the other hand, it's possible that barred, uh, spotted owls were doing just fine, but barred owls were moving in and causing the decline of the spotted owl. And so even though you know, these are really compelling graphs, we don't know what the causation was. So in our final report, this is what the language included, but the opinion on the panel was divided. So while all panelists thought it was a major threat, the barred owl, um, some panelists still felt that the scientific case for the effect of barred owls was inconclusive. And so it was mentioned as an important factor, but we all agreed that more studies had to take place. So I'll talk about those studies in just a couple minutes, but first of all, who are these barred owls? Where do they come from? How do they get here? And what are they doing here? So um, the barred owl, Strix varia, this is kind of like the Eastern counterpart to, to our um, northern spotted owl here. I grew up in, in Ohio and this was one of my favorite owls. It was like the, the, the dominating species at night, the one that you would hear hooting. Um, it's a large chocolate brown owl. It's slightly bigger than our northern spotted owl, but it's ecologically very similar. They like those big forests. They're a little bit more aggressive, at least here in the western United States, not as tame as the northern spotted owl. Just like our owls here, they tend to prefer mature old growth forests, typically of mis mixed deciduous coniferous um, composition, um, but you know most of those forests in the east are, are not as big as the forests in the west, so they are adapted a little bit differently. Um, they're primarily an owl of the eastern United States, Mexico, and Canada. And so when I look back at my old field guide, and this is my old golden field guide to North American birds that, was, um, that, that came out in 1983, and this is what it shows the range of the barred owl to be. And you can see here that they're not anywhere near, well, I guess they're getting near, but they're not in yet um, spotted owl, in the spotted owl range. But then if you move along to 2000, um, the year 2000 for birds of, of North America species account, this is what you, you see. So by that period, they'd already moved well into Washington, Oregon, and into Northern California. If you look at eBird records um, from today, this is what you'll see. You'll see them all the way up into the panhandle of Alaska, into the Yukon, and all the way down as far as, as Bakersfield. And if we blow up on that California section, and this is combining a lot of different data from VertNet, GBIF, eBird, uh, Cal Department of Fish and Wildlife database, you can see that not only do they get into the Sierras, but they're all the way down the spine of the Sierras, almost to Bakersfield. They're all the way down into Marin County here, and they've really begun to pack in the forests uh, along the coast in California and up into Oregon. It's much denser here, but a lot of the points that you see here are from California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, databases, and so um, they just don't have as, as much of the data up there in Oregon in this data set. So how did the owls get here? Um, and that's an important question. Um, this is the Hansen Forest Cover North America data set. And so it basically is green where you see big forests and it's dark where you don't. And so this is the Great Plains. And this would have been a formidable barrier to a forest owl. And so one hypothesis that um, biologists were, were sort of analyzing and experimenting with was that the likelihood that this was probably an owl of the eastern United States, but as climate warmed, it may have allowed the owls to move northward in their range, and that allowed them to catch these southern boreal forests of Canada and move westward. And that, this is that portion of the range here that we see. So that may be what, it, what connected the eastern population um, here with our western population of uh, northern spotted owls. But another possibility, and this is from a paper by Kent Livesey, 
Um, he also, you know, looked at a lot of these data and said, yes, this is definitely a, a possible route. And you can see records of owls in this part of Canada. But you also see a smattering of owls here, some that go back as far as the 1800s. Um, the late 1800s. And, and these are in little forest patches that were mostly planted or maintained by, by humans, by mostly by Westerners as they moved into the Great Plains and wanted to plant trees um, along river corridors and, and other places where the Native Americans didn't necessarily plant them. And his hypothesis was, or at least a second hypothesis was, that they may have moved westward through areas that were altered by humans. So, um, so we're not really sure which one of these is, is correct and some genetic analyses that we're hoping to do in the future might be able to, to shed some light on that. Um, but either route was likely made possible by human caused changes to the environment. Now this becomes important when you start thinking about conservation actions because if the owls moved out here on their own, you might say, oh, well, this is a, this is a natural event and we should just let nature play out. One owl's gonna win and one owl's gonna lose and you know, just let it play out. But if humans caused that, or if humans did something to tip the scales in the favor of barred owls, whether that's you know, landscape alterations in the Great Plains, or whether it's cl climate change, or whether we change the structure of our Western forests by cutting them so much, those might all have tipped the balance in favor of barred owls. And, it's, and then we might wanna think a little bit about that in terms of management. Hey, Jack. Yeah. Yes. One question here. Um, will NSOs tolerate other similar sized non-threatening species of owl in their territory? Um, well, there aren't that many other owls their, their size. And generally, you know, the way evolution works, there's, you know, there's, there's room for a, an owl of one particular size. Um, and then the larger owls that would typically be here or in the east would be great horned owls, and they're going to be feeding on larger types of prey. And then the smaller owls in here in our forest, these might be western screech owls or northern pygmy owls. And because of those size differences, they don't really overlap too much. Um, but what happens is, is, is when ranges of species that didn't normally come into contact do come into contact, they might clash and they might fight over that niche space for that medium-sized owl. And that's what's happening, in fact. You know, the, the, the barred owl and spotted owl are both in the same genus and they're both kind of ecological equivalents to some degree. Um, but when they come together, they're gonna have to battle it out for, you know, that niche space here in the Western United States. So I hope that answers your question. But one of the other questions that we would be very interested in knowing is, well, how far are these barred owls gonna go? Are they gonna just go a certain distance and then the rest of it is gonna be left for, for spotted owls or are we gonna see a complete overrun? So in order to do this, um, colleagues Talon Peterson and some other folks from University of Kansas did some um, habitat niche modeling. And basically what they do is they take all these points from the eastern United States and they use climate layers, layers like rainfall, uh, temperature, um, you know, first snow, last snow, all these kinds of, of, of different climate variables. And then they make a model of, of what defines where barred owls like to live. And then they basically take that model and they project it onto the Western United States to say, well, this is where barred owls are likely to end up based on what they like. And unfortunately, what they, what they found was that they're going to they're gonna basically fill up all the habitat that, that um, northern spotted owls were in and probably a lot of the habitat that California spotted owls were in. And if we look at these types of areas, we can see already these are filled with, with barred owls. So they seem to be doing quite well in those areas. So, okay, so now to get back to, you know, what do we do about this or how do we think about it or what studies do we need to do to understand what's actually going on? When we were writing that opinion piece in 2004 for that five-year review, um, we started putting our heads together and say, well, what information do we need to know? And biologists at the time said, well, one of the, the, the key things in the, the classic definitive study is a removal study where you go in and you remove barred owls and then you see if spotted owls can come back and that allows you to actually measure the impact the quantity and the types of impacts that are important and um and see whether barred owls are, are a critical factor but they said you know unfortunately we can't do that kind of work because because barred owls are protected under the migratory bird species act and i was the only museum person in the room and I raised my hand and I said, well, you know, you guys, I actually have a permit to collect because one of the jobs of museum, of museum biologists is to document 
biodiversity. And we usually do that by collecting a, a small number of specimens and then making sure that we have really good material from those so that we can study them. And I said, you know, to my knowledge, these barred owls really have not been documented in the Western United States. And I would love to get a small sample of them for the, for the museum. And I would be more than happy to do those removals where you can do the follow-up experiments and, and study how the spotted owl responds to those barred owl removals. And so they sort of scratched their head and said, yeah, let's talk about that. We, we could do that. And, um, and so that got that dialogue going. But we were all a little bit uncomfortable about starting these kinds of studies. And, and we all agreed that there are other kinds of studies that can be done as well. And these involve ecological studies where you can go into an area where both owls exist and you can study the range size. Are they interacting? Are they aggressive to each other? What do, they, what do they feed on? Does their niche overlap and those kinds of things. And so we got together in 2005 up in Arcata and a number of bio, owl biologists from around the country got together in this meeting to talk about what studies needed to be done. And there were a bunch of other studies that were proposed, but these were the ones that rose to the top that people felt were really critical. And so at that time, they actually expanded my permit and asked me to do a special barred owl removal study um, that I'll explain shortly. Um, and there was also another team of biologists um, up in Oregon who got to work on these ecological studies. So I'll report a little bit back on both of these in just a second. So first of all, let me talk about the removal experiments. Um, so the goals of the removal experiment were, first of all, to document barred owls in the Western United States. So we were not doing this to manage barred owls in any way. We were really doing it to document the owls and then to understand, well, how do spotted owls respond to the barred owl removal? Do they respond positively, negatively? Do barred owls even have any impact? Or the barred owls actually moving into empty spaces and, and, the, you know, and they're not really impacting spotted. The other thing is that people were already beginning to think about, you know, is removal a management strategy? Is that something that we could do? And some biologists said, it'll never work, it's impossible. Other biologists said, hey, one thing that we've been able to, to show ourselves over time is that we can wipe out top predators when we want to, and we've done it around the world over and over. And so one of the other questions is, is can barred owl be, be efficiently removed from spotted owl reserves and, and what's the cost of that? So, um, so we started these studies um, up in the Siskiyou, up in an area called Goose Nest, where we worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Wairika office. And we also teamed up with Green Diamond Natural Resources, which is a timber company in Northern California, working in Del Norte and Humboldt County. But I was assured that the folks I were gonna be working with and Lowell Diller in particular was an amazing biologist, knew so much about owls, really cared about them, and it was gonna publish the data regardless of what they found and regardless of what it said about their timber operations. So I felt more comfortable about that. It turns out that Lowell Diller and Green Diamond were amazing partners to work with, and I, and I was really happy with working with them. All the owls that were removed had to, had to meet these criteria. First of all, they had to be, on, they had to be paired um, territory holding barred owls. They had to be on territories that were formerly occupied by spotted owls, usually in the last year or two years. So, and that's just to make sure that there would be some spotted owls that might be able to come back. Um, 11 owls were removed from uh, the goose nest area and 20 owls were removed from Green Diamond. Now, I don't wanna pull any punches here, you know, removal of owls is not a pretty thing. Um, and I want you to wrap your mind around this too, because if there is a discussion about management in the future, I want you to understand what that means and what that actually looks like. And so to, to capture these owls or to collect these owls, we usually would use um, a small speaker that was primed with a bunch of owl calls. We could call the owls in with these um, remote digital callers. And then they were removed with a 12 gauge shotgun with an illuminated aim point so that we could be out there at night. And this is not a sport. This is not a, these are not fair, fair shots. We lure them in as closely as possible. And we make sure that they're close enough that you have a sure shot that they can be taken in one shot and that the owls don't suffer. Then once we, once we have them, um, we take a variety of different field measurements, as much data as we can, all the information about our effort, how much time do we spend, which calls we played, all that sort of stuff. Full tissues for studies of DNA, RNA, environmental contaminants, diseases that they might carry. Um, we also collected the entire carcass that was frozen, was brought back to the Cal Academy. And this is the kind of traditional museum skin that you'll see in the museum. We have about 100,000 museum skins uh, of birds in our museum. Most of 
which were collected a long, long time ago when we were still trying to figure out what birds were here in North Carolina, but, or North, Northern California. But we still um, do some um, additions to the collection. Most of it's salvage, window kill, road kill, things the cat dragged in, stuff like that. But on occasion, we will do um, studies like this. This is a very traditional study skin. Here you can see all the, the, the plumage. Uh, measure, you can take measurements of the legs, the beak, um, wings, feathers, you can look at molt, things like that. From the barred owls, all of the postcranial material and all the internal material, uh, all those bones, all the muscle was pickled in ethanol and kept in jars like this. The stomach contents were separated and analyzed and put in jars like this. So we had information about their stomach contents. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about all the uses that we have of those specimens in a couple minutes. But first of all, let's go back to the goals of that study. So one of the, one of the primary goals was to figure out um, are these removals effective and cost effective in particular? And what we found was that, um, and here we have time, time to the shot on this axis and the number of owls here. So you can see that the vast majority, over 50% of the owls were collected uh, under 60 minutes. And these are the females. Males took a little bit longer, but the vast majority of them were collected under 90 minutes. Um, and so that shows that it doesn't take that much time in the field to go out uh, and, and collect these individuals where they need to be removed. But the big question was, is do spotted, owl do spotted owls recover after the removals? And are barred owls displacing spotted owls? So um, we kept track of all the spotted owls that were in those areas. So nine territories uh, met the criteria for removal. And after the barred owls were removed, all nine historical spotted, spotted owl sites were reoccupied by spotted owls. Now, four of those sites were reoccupied by the original banded resident spotted owl. And one of them, the female, hadn't been seen for seven years. And this suggests that she was out there, but silent and pushed off of their breeding, act, their main activity center and unable to breed or, or even call back. They were just hunkered down and hiding from the barred owls for quite some time. But the good news was that they were still there. They were still alive. Um, so um, the rest were reoccupied by new or unknown spotted owls. And so this suggested that the habitat really um, was a limiting factor, as we already knew, um, but that as the habitat is taken up by barred owls, they exclude spotted owls. And the spotted owls are waiting for a place to settle, but there are none available because of the barred owls. Now, interestingly, spotted owls were again displaced at three of these sites, and barred owls were again removed. Um, and in those areas, they were able to collect some demographic data, and they were able to show that spotted owl occupancy was increasing in those areas, but in the control areas, where no barred owls were removed, spotted owl occupancy continued to decline. And so that was really hopeful. So the removals were feasible. They weren't too costly. Spotted owls responded very favorably and numbers of barred owls did decrease. Um, and the fecundity and survival of spotted owls appeared to be significantly higher in the removal areas. So with these data in mind, new studies were being designed and, and were begun on green diamond land, lands and other lands. And at this point, I pulled back uh, and other parties did most of the collecting in the field, but we remained at the Academy a repository. So anyone who was doing these experiments, we did everything that we could to get all that material and make sure that it was preserved in collection so that it could still be studied. We didn't want any of that to go to waste. As long as people were collecting these owls, we wanted to make sure that we had those carcasses and were able to, to do something with them. So now with these follow-up studies, can barred owl removals lead to spotted owl recovery? So again, these are the, the follow-up studies that were being done on green diamond lamb, land. And here, the, uh, the pink lands are untreated and they're paired with treated areas. So the yellow areas are areas where barred owls were removed. And they tried their best to remove all the barred owls from this, these areas starting around 2009. And as you can see here, um, this, is the, this is occupancy. So this is the number of territories by spotted owls. And you can see that occupancy is going down, down, down. And then here they started doing those removals. And in 2010, already you could see a difference between the treated areas in which the spotted owls began to recover and actually increase. Um, and in the control areas where barred owls were not removed, the spotted owls continued to decrease in their occupancy. Um, and one more 
one more bit of evidence. In 2016, Katie Duger and her team up in Oregon, and in fact, they collect data from all across the, the, the different demographic study areas from Washington, a variety of spots in Oregon, and a couple spots in Northern California. They compiled all the data, um, and they were able to show that every one of the populations was in decline. So this is lambda equals 1.0. And every one of these populations was in decline with the exception of that last population here, which is the green diamond treated area where barred owls were removed. So this is some of the data that really, really locked in for people that, um, that barred owls were having a serious impact on spotted owls and that there were a critical factor in the decline of spotted owls. So now um, let's get back to that ecological study that I mentioned. So a group of people up in Oregon led by uh, Dave Weens, um, Eric Forsman and Anthony. So they did a study in an area called the Veneta study area, which is in the Oregon coast ranges. This is one of the old demographic study areas. So they had lots and lots of information on spotted owls from this area that's about a thousand square kilometers. So it's quite a big chunk of land. Um, they chose this area because from, from what they thought they knew, um, it was an area where there were both spotted owls and barred owls, probably in equal numbers. But when they actually went out and started the study and did the surveys, what they found was that across the entire study area, there were only 15 pairs of spotted owls and 82 territorial pairs of barred owls. So literally uh, five to one barred owls to spotted owls. So they didn't realize just how bad it was. In most places, you don't realize it until you actually go out and do those, um, those barred owl specific surveys. But this was not a good sign, even from the beginning. Some of the different things that they look at were spatial relationships. How much land, um, what's, the, what's the home range size? How much land does each species need? And uh, here you can see that they mapped on the home ranges. So this is the total year round uh, use. And this is the core area where breeding usually takes place, the, the, where the activity center um, it can be found. And what they found was, you know, they mapped, this is the spotted owl uh, breeding size. So the, the spotted owls required about 1500 hectares um, just in the breeding core area. Whereas uh, barred owls required about a third of that, only about 500. Um, hectares on average. So, you know, quite a bit of difference there. If you look at, you know, the amount of land they use year long in their, in their entire um, home range, you can see that it's quite a bit bigger for both owls. But again, barred owls need quite a bit less than spotted owls. Um, and that is going to be a critical factor. And that's partially um, because um, uh, the differences in diet. Uh, again, spotted owls take, you know, 90 to 95 percent mammals, mostly mammals, but barred owls, while they still love mammals and what their favorite foods still consist of um, the same kinds of things, um, you know, those, those medium-sized mammals, um, dusky-footed wood rats and um, northern flying squirrels, they'll take a lot of other things, um, hares, larger squirrels, and a variety of other things from birds, amphibians, reptiles, crayfish, fish, insects, um, and mollusks, other things. Um, there's still quite a bit of diet overlap, about 42% of the, of the diet overlaps pretty heavily. Um, so, you know, they still are competing for a lot of the same resources, but barred owls can do, do well even in places where spotted owls can't. And even places that would be substandard for spotted owls, the barred owls can still do quite well and crank out young. So reproductive output is another really important thing to look at. And one of the things that they looked at was the number of young fledged per pair. So spotted owls, especially up in that area, they tend to breed every second year and they'll lay one to two eggs. And so their, their annualized reproductive rate um, to fledging is only about 0.31 birds per pair, okay? Um, barred owls, on the other hand, um, usually lay one to three eggs and they tend to, to mate and nest every year. And so their annualized reproductive um, output is about 1.36 young per year fledged. Pair. Um, and, and this is uh, about four, four point something times as much as spotted owls. So they're out reproducing them four to one um, just by these numbers. But then if you also consider that there's so many more barred owls in the area than there are spotted owls, um, that their overall reproduction um, was quite a bit higher. Um, and as much as six times as many young of barred owls were being produced as spotted owls annually. 
Another thing that was really interesting was that all spotted owls that attempted to nest within 1.5 kilometers of a barred owl nest failed to produce any young. And that was evidence of, of some aggressive, uh, aggressiveness and aggressive interactions between barred owls and spotted owls. So the news wasn't good. Um, in fact, it showed that, that barred owls had a competitive advantage over spotted owls um, in so many different categories. They were larger, 10 to 20% larger. Barred owls were more aggressive. Barred owls attack and may even kill northern spotted owls. Barred owls require smaller territories. Um, they have a more generalist diet. Um, they're more of a habitat generalist. They can live in areas that would be substandard habitat for northern spotted owls. They breed more regularly, annually. They have larger broods. Uh, they have greater dispersal. And over the area, they outnumbered spotted owls already four to one. And that was when they thought they were more or less in equal numbers. Um, so, the, so then putting that all together between those two sets of studies, the main threats from barred owls appear to be competition, direct aggression and interference, simply out reproducing spotted owls. And the last one that, that folks have been studying is hybridization, but we're not really sure um, how to, to, to read the hybridization. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple minutes. Um, so, you know, if it was just spotted owls, maybe you'd be like, well, you know, that's a shame, but, you know, nature's going to do what nature's going to do. Um, but one of the things that's important to note is that because barred owls do eat a lot of other things, they're not just affecting northern spotted owls. In fact, there have been other studies um, looking at things like other small owls. And here's one of a couple different papers looking at average numbers of western screech owls here. Um, on Bainbridge Island between 95 and 2010. And what you can see is that when barred owls first arrived and then got settled, um, the, the smaller owls in this area began to disappear. A lot of the biologists that work in other areas up north have said the same things, but again, most biologists don't have money to study that even though they might have some anecdotal evidence or some of the data in their field notebooks on it. Um, but there, but a lot of people are saying, yeah, we're we're not hearing northern pygmy owl anymore. We're not hearing western screech owl. We're not seeing saw wet owls as much, and so they are having a big impact on on other species. And folks are beginning to look at things like some of the the salamanders, some of the protected frogs, some of the protected snakes too. And there's some hint that they might may be affected. So um, so it's not just northern spotted owls, but those are the things that are protected and listed as threatened now and that people have the money to study. And so that's where most of the effort's been so far. So now I wanna get back to you know, all those owls that we've been gathering from all these different groups that have been doing these removal experiments. And we're trying to do what we can to make use of them and, and try and be creative and also you know, inform some of the conservation needs. So what do you do with a whole lot of dead owls in the collection? So I wanted to just highlight a few of these studies really quickly and kind of fly through this. Um, but one thing that you can do is when you shine a, a black light on, on freshly molted bird feathers, the porphyrin pigments will glow pink. And a lot of birds, those are broken down by UV light and they disappear with time. But owls, because they're only active at night and they keep their feathers closed during the day, you can still see those. So you can easily see molt patterns in these birds. So these pink feathers are the newly molted ones and these white ones are the, are the older ones that the pigments have broken down in. People have been able to use some of this um, to look at the owls, understand molts, and be able to figure out how to classify in the hand um, from a bird that may be banded and released, how to age them, potentially how to sex them, um, and, and how to look at other things like how to detect hybrids and things like that. So that's been a very important line of research that folks are involved in. Um, we've done a, a bit of work with uh, parasites. We've done um, some sequencing work to look at uh, malaria type paras parasites like plasmo plasmodium, leucocytosone, hemoproteus, and look at those incidences. Because one of the questions is, are barred owls actually bringing diseases from the Eastern United States that spotted owls may not be have resistance to? We can all relate to that right now with COVID-19 floating around, but that, you know, some people think that may be a factor. And we found some really interesting parasites. This is a, an eye worm um, that, uh, almost 100% of the owls coming out of the Hoopa tribal lands um, were infected with. So barred owls have a high infection rate and we're working with some parasitologists to understand what the fit fitness effects of these parasites are and how they actually affect the owls. I mentioned the diet study earlier. One of the interesting things is we've been able to look through all these stomach contents and there are a lot of things that these uh, barred owls are eating that won't be preserved in, in pellets. 
And by looking at stomach contents, we were able to, to look at this. I'm gonna kind of fly through these slides, but one of the things we found was looking at mammals, we found that only 50% of the, the diet by total bi biomass was mammals. Some of the main, the same players, northern flying squirrels on there, dusky footed wood rats, but also look at this, um, things like American shrew mole, a bunch of different shrews here, and a lot of things from the ground are turning up. And we often will get owls that have mud caked onto their talons because they're raking through the leaf litter and digging in the ground for things. We've even got pictures of them, uh, colleagues have pictures of them pulling earthworms out of the ground. So their diets are very different than um, spotted owls in that respect. Fully a quarter of their diet is avian prey. So they're eating a lot of other birds out there. Um, these are some of the different things that we found. Um, Western screech owls were in the diet, northern pygmy owl were in the diet, but even things as large as ruffed grouse and band-tailed pigeons um, are in the diet. So quite a few birds, many more birds than, um, than uh, northern spotted owl takes. But amphibians were also 17%, um, all kinds of interesting things, a lot of the common things, but also coastal giant salamander. We had two birds with rough skin newts, and we actually wrote a paper about that, because if you know, Rough skin newts are pretty poisonous. If we tried to eat one, it would probably do us in. Um, so that was interesting that they were able to eat those. Um, rep reptiles, about three, three and a half percent of the diet was reptiles, including things like alligator lizards, um, garter snakes, uh, and other snakes, and, um, and invertebrates. And this was one of the really interesting things, all kinds of stuff from katydids, crickets, forest scorpions, land snails, um, centipedes, caterpillars, beetles, ants, termites, all kinds of stuff. And even though it wasn't a huge percentage um, of the biomass, sometimes the numbers in a single bird's um, stomach were huge. It was absolutely filled with, with shieldback katydids. Um, and that may allow them to get through times of the year um, that northern spotted owls would be a little bit more taxed. So if we you know, re-look re at the, these data just based on the stomach contents, we see um, that they eat a, a lot fewer mammals and they, they will be impacting a lot of other populations as well in the forests. Um, so um, we are working up some of this data and colleagues in, in Oregon have even bigger data sets on, uh, on the diet. Another thing that we did was, uh, it's very rare for us to have samples from top predators in the environment. And so having them allows you to look at whole food chain effects uh, and contamination by different environmental toxins. And so one of the things we were able to do was look at the livers of these owls and ask questions about exposure to rodenticides and use northern, or using barred owls basically as a proxy for what all top predators, including northern spotted owls, goshawks, and other things might be exposed to. And um, we, we um, surveyed about 84 um, livers from different barred owls over a series of different years. And we found overall that about 40% of them showed significant levels of rodenticides in their livers and that they had a high exposure. Now at first we were like, oh well, you know, these must have been owls that were near roads or near industry or near agriculture. And it turned out that most of these were owls that were way out in the middle of nowhere. And when you began looking at the year and satellite images from those times, what we found that they were almost always associated with illegal trespass marijuana grows. And this is, and in fact other folks were doing research in parallel. Um, finding a lot of this, and some other papers have come out um, showing that you know a lot of these illegal marijuana growing operations have huge amounts of pesticides that they haul out into the woods that they sprinkle around very liberally because there's no because they're not following any regulations. They get into the water, um, the water channel, into the streams, and into the rivers. Um, they but they get into the food chain, and so small rodents are eating them, larger things are eating them. They're dying on the spot from these toxins. Then other scavengers and other predators move in and begin to eat on those, feed on those carcasses. And it's becoming quite a serious thing. Um, here's another paper by Dave Weens and his group up in Oregon. They did a similar study from birds from Oregon and Washington. And from there, almost 50% of the owls tested positive for ARs, these uh, um, uh, rodenticides, anticoagulant rodenticides. What's interesting is, is these, these marijuana grows are, are becoming even more toxic and they're starting to use even more toxic stuff like carbofurans, which are, um, which are uh, in cases of a bear coming in, feeding on something, dropping dead right there, and then vultures coming down and vulture carcasses are literally right beside the bear because that's how toxic they are. And uh, these are even difficult to clean up. Um, so that's been really fascinating. And again, we were able to reveal that by looking at, at these carcasses that have been coming in. 
Another thing that's been really interesting is when these carcasses begin, began coming into the museum, we noticed that Western barred owls shown here in the middle look quite different from Eastern barred owls. Um, some look more like Eastern barred owls, but many of them are, are smaller, they're darker. And if you look at the patterning on the belly, it's quite different from what you would see in an Eastern barred owl. And if you compare that to a Northern spotted owl shown here, um, we began to suspect that they may be hybridizing. Um, and so uh, we did some work just looking at the morphologies and we measured a whole bunch of different characteristics like the bill length and depth and talon length and, and sizes and a whole bunch of different measurements of the wing and tail, uh, color measurements and patterning of the feather measurements. And what we found is that it's not that hard mathematically. And this is a, something called a principal components analysis, which takes all those different dimensions and kind of smashes them down into two. Um, but what it shows here is that it's not that hard to distinguish um, Eastern barred owls from Western barred owls that are shown in green in the Klamath um, spot, uh, Klamath barred owls, sorry, that are shown here in, in orange. So the Western ones are the green and orange and the Eastern owls are shown here in blue. And they really do look different. They can be told apart often in the hand um, and definitely with these different measurements. Um, so then one of the questions is, is, is what causes these differences? Um, is it hybridization? Are we finding that, that there has been some history of hybridization? So Western barred owls have picked up genes from spotted owls? Or is it just because they went through a genetic bottleneck and genetic drift has caused them to look differently? Or another possibility is that they've actually adapted in some ways. Um, and the Western forests, you know, adaptation is asking these owls to be a little bit smaller, a little bit darker, a little bit more spotted. So these are all different possibilities. And in order to answer these different questions, um, we've been working on the Spotted Owl Genome Project. And this was the, the actual whole genome of the Northern Spotted Owl was done with an owl that's in um, wild care at San Rafael, was brought into captivity in, in 2005, I think it was. Um, but it's, it's a pure Northern Spotted spotted owl, we have its whole genome sequence, and then we're using that as reference to do a whole bunch of different tests, looking um, at spotted owl divergences, at barred owl divergences, at, at hybrids, and all kinds of stuff that's a little bit too complicated to, to talk about here and would take too long. Um, but it's been fascinating research, um, and, it's, and it's proving really, really interesting. Um, but lastly, I want to talk about a much bigger barred owl removal study that began in July 2013 and was led by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they included, because they wanted to look range-wide at what the impacts would be of barred owl removals and begin to really experiment with the possibility of using barred owl removals as a management tool to help recover the northern spotted owls. And so they had four different areas, um, including clay alum, which is here in Washington State, um, this is the, the study area in Oregon that we've already talked a little bit about where Dave Weens has been working. This is um, Southern uh, Oregon in the Klamath Range. And then this is the Hoopa Tribe lands and Willow Creek, which are two important demographic study areas as well. And so each one of these had paired removal and non-removal areas for comparison. And now they've had uh, four full years of study and across all the different areas, they're on their last year of the study. And I just wanna summarize some of the results here. So overall, they've, they've removed 2,164 barred owls across the area, 499 in Clay Elm, about 1,000 in the Oregon Coast Range and about 600 in the Klamath um, Union Myrtle area. So that's a pretty big number of owls, but still you know, quite, quite a bit under what they had originally projected, uh, 3,600 owls. Um, now, if we look at the different areas, this is the clay alum area in Washington. And because barred owls have been up in the north for the longest amount of time, you'll notice that they're starting already with very low numbers of owls. Um, only 25 in the treatment area and only about 19 in the control area. And you can see that from 2004 to 2016, um, that these owls are continuing to decline to the point where there's, there's almost none left in the area. Um, and then they, you know, began the removals. You can see, you know, maybe here in the treatment areas, they might be a little bit harder, uh, doing a little bit better. But again, the, uh, the difference is going to, it's going to take a lot of statistics to really pull that apart and see what's going on. But what you can clearly see is that, um, is that these populations are doing quite well. Um, these are populations from um, the Middle Oregon Coast Range, and because uh, the barred owls got there a little bit later, the numbers are a little bit higher, you know, somewhere around 56 and somewhere um, around 38, um, but you know, since 2004, these numbers have declined quite a bit, 
and then you know during the during the study the uh, the control area where no removals were happening um, the owls continued to decline quite precipitously um, but here where the um, barred owl removals were being done you can see that they've more or less stabilized um, so that's a little bit helpful hopeful and then lastly if we look at the at the Klamath area here you can see that they had quite a few more owls to begin with, again, because they're a little bit further south and the barred owls haven't been there as long. Um, but again, you're seeing the same trends. So the, the owls are really in decline in, from the point that you know, they had uh, between 70 and, a, and 100 owls to begin with in these different areas, but now they're down to you know, on the range of 20 to 30 owls in both. But again, um, the control area where no removals took place in blue continues to decline whereas the, uh, the removal area seems to be leveled off a little bit more. But it's gonna take some statistics and it's gonna take a lot more analysis to try and figure out you know, what's really going on. So the big questions here is, you know, what's the future of, of barred owls? And some of the remaining questions that biologists are grappling with is, was well, there some habitat type where spotted owls might have the upper hand and maybe we can, we can help them by managing habitat? Um, are there defensible areas like maybe Marin County, for example, where there aren't that many barred owls yet, or even California spotted owl range where spotted owls might be able to persist even if it's not the Northern spotted owl. Um, is there, and one of the things that they're wrestling with is, is management of barred owls an option. So by law, under the Endangered Species Act, US Fish and Wildlife Service is required to identify the most serious threats and find ways to address each. One of the serious threats at this point is barred owls and they have to figure out how to address it. Nobody knows at this point whether removals is really gonna be palatable or whether it's gonna be supported politically or by folks like you who have to, who go and vote and will determine really in the end whether or not management like this happens. That's why I think this is such an important case is because as habitat becomes restricted and smaller and smaller, so there's less and less of it to fight over, and as animals change their ranges because of our manipulations or because of climate change and animals needing to move, what we're finding is, is that they're bound to be more and more clashes like this. And more and more species are gonna come into contact that didn't used to be, or in invasive species on different levels from other continents, maybe not from other sides of the same continent, but from other continents come into contact and begin to have impacts. And how are we gonna to decide to manage lands? How far are we willing to go to achieve these conservation goals? So I think that these are really important questions to ask. And I also just wanna throw at you that you know, there's, a, there's a long precedent already out there. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of brown-headed cowbirds and red-winged blackbirds and common grackles are removed um, under depredation permits in the United States. And sometimes this is just to protect a cornfield or to, or to, to clear um, a power line or something like that. These are really important things and nobody debates that. But, you know, one of the questions is, um, is if we're willing to kill hundreds of thousands of brown-headed cowbirds for these, for these other purposes, or red-winged blackbirds for agriculture, you know, how many birds are we willing to remove for conservation aims? So I also wanna go back to the brown-headed cowbird because many of these cowbirds are removed for conservation aims. But again, they're cowbirds. There's reasons why people don't like them or they think that they're, they're you know, amoral birds because they put their eggs in other birds' nests or whatever, you know, but they're small birds. They're not nearly as charismatic as a barred owl, which is a beautiful owl that I grew up with and loved growing up with. But we're, you know, for example, 125,000 cowbirds were killed on the breeding grounds for Kirtland's warblers in 1972 to 2002. And many, 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 um, many, many thousands, dozens of thousands of double-crested cormorants are removed along um, some of the rivers in the Northwest in order to protect sta salmon stocks. But again, the salmon are commercially fished as well. Uh, so it's not just a conservation aim. But one of the really big questions that I have out there is, are we also willing to kill hundreds of thousands of, of, of birds to create healthy forests? Um, are we willing to do that to protect endangered species? And honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what is the ethical thing to do. And neither does Fish and Wildlife Service at this point. But it's something that they are required by law to consider. And it's something that you're gonna see, that you're gonna be asked in the next few years because 
they are going to be faced with trying to figure out how to preserve the northern spotted owl. So um, some final thoughts for you, because I don't want to just leave you with a bleak picture. I mean, it is a somewhat bleak picture, but um, I want everyone to, to get involved and engage in these deba de the debates and in the decision-making process, but make sure that you truly inform yourselves about what the issues are and, you know, and what's at stake and, and what the, the scientists are learning so that you know what's going on. And second of all, I would say, get out there and see these spotted owls while we still have them, because I don't know how much longer they're gonna be around. So enjoy them and celebrate them, love them. Their future is far from certain. So that's what I had to share with you. And I'm sorry that we don't actually get to go out and look at these owls here now, but um, hopefully after this COVID-19 thing blows over, we'll all be able to go out birding again and we're gonna be able to see some of these things. Um, and I wanna thank all the folks who did these amazing studies that I highlighted today. They come from lots of different institutions, from government to private to, to Hoopa tribal forestry lands and all the folks who helped fund it. And, um, and I'm more than happy to answer questions about this. Thank you all very, very much. Hey, thanks, Jack. We do have a few questions here that um, I would like to get answered for these attendees. And one is, maybe you already mentioned this, but from my reading, it seems that barred owls were in the Pacific Northwest before European people arrived, but in relatively small numbers. However, with modern logging practices, they have increased their range in numbers and that is why they are now such a threat to spotted owls. Is that a correct summary? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I, I don't think that they were in the Pacific Northwest um, before Westerners um, arrived. There's an open question about when they first came out to the to the um, to the Western United States. Let me see if I can um, get one of those. Actually, it might be hard to, to scroll back, but um, but the the, the owls were really an eastern species but they do they do get down into um they do overlap with mexican spotted owls uh in some of the desert areas but they don't seem to clash down there interestingly so they've they've figured out how to how to sort it out down there um but most of the data that i've seen um in fact there was there was one paper that suggested it was around um the 1950s maybe that they first got into washington and, and maybe um, I'm trying to remember the actual dates from, from those papers, but it, but it wasn't until the, the mid 1900s the, that, they, that they got into the Pacific Northwest. Um, they were moving westward before then, but they didn't make it to the Pacific Northwest until much more recently. Now that said, I'll say that um, there are some open questions about how far they did get prior to then. Um, and, and where they had some other refugia. Some of the genetic data that we're beginning to look at um, suggests that the, the barred owls we have in the Western United States are way more than 100 years diverged from the ones in the Eastern United States and that they do have some, some uh, unique alleles and some things that evolved suggesting that you know, either the population that we're using as reference from the Eastern United States is not the source population for the Western ones or that there was some other population maybe in Canada or maybe um, somewhere in the Great Plains that um, that ended up being the source for the population in the West, but we're still working on that, and um, and we don't know the answers to that yet. But but these owls were not in um, in the Pacific Northwest prior to to Westerners arriving here. Thanks, Jack. Okay, uh, we have another one. I'm fascinated by the fact that spotted owls were in hiding during their occupation by barred owls. Where do you think they were hanging out? Is there evidence that their prey choices were impacted during that time? Does that indicate that they are more plastic in their territory choices than might be believed? So, so the question was, was are spotted owls, were spotted owls hanging out in places where, when they were displaced? Um, he basically was saying like, um, in quotes, that they were in hiding when there were barred owls around. So where do you think right. they were? And is there evidence that maybe their prey was impacted at that time or that they may be more, it sounds like maybe f more fluid in their choices of territory than believed prior? Right, well, um, maybe more fluid, in, you know, they definitely can get pushed out to substandard habitats, but remember they're not able to reproduce areas. So there's no evidence that they were reproducing and the biologists who were working in those areas weren't counting, they weren't finding offspring from them. So the fact that they're able to live is, is good and interesting, but it's very different from thriving there. 
And, um, and so in, in a lot of the data that biologists have, you know, suggest that, that even when they get dis displaced, it, it might take a long time for them to go truly extinct, but at the same time, they're not thriving and cranking out young. Um, one, interesting, one interesting bit of data from this is, um, is that Canada started to do removals of barred owls as well. And they did it a little bit more quietly and secretively and didn't talk as much about it. And up there, there had really basically been very few, if any, records of northern spotted owls. So people were, you know, questioning the utility of it. They said, well, you can remove barred owls, but there are no spotted owls that come back. And the good news was that there were some spotted owls that came back, albeit very, very few. Um, but that, but that the, the hopeful thing is that, you know, there may still be some, some spotted owls out there lurking, just hanging on, maybe able to feed. But, you know, the other thing is, is that when they become that rare, they have a hard time finding mates. So um, when U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was planning the removal studies in, or in, not in Oregon, but in Washington, there was a lot of debate about whether or not they should even do it in Washington for the same reasons. They felt like, well, we can remove barred owls, but there probably aren't any spotted owls. And the numbers of spotted owls were so low, and oftentimes there was a male way over here and then a female over here. So even though there were numbers of them, they were far enough apart that they were having a hard time finding mates. And, um, and, and so, you know, so they thought, is it even ethical to, to kill a bunch of barred owls where there's very little hope of recovery? And they ended up doing it because they felt like it was important to do the study. And the good news was that there were some spotted owls out there that, that popped up. They were in the matrix, um, as the biologists say, that those are owls that don't have territories. They're not settled. They're not breeding, but they're, but they're out there. And they're very hard to count because they're not territorial. So when you, when you go out there and you play spotted owl calls, they don't respond because they're not defending a territory or fighting and they don't want to pick a fight, you know, so, so they're very hard to survey. And so, you know, you can survey territorial owls, but it's very hard to get a handle on, you know, the, the number of owls that are in the matrix, if, if you will. And, um, and so, so I think that gets to the heart of your, um, the, of the question is that, you know, we really don't know that much about the biology of, of owls that are in the matrix and how many there are and, and exactly what they're doing and how well they're thriving. So um, those, are, those are great questions, but the hope is, and the data do show that there are some still out there. Okay, Jack, we have another question. Do we know whether the barred owls are also having population level impacts to their other prey species? So we don't know that much, and it's mostly just because um, there isn't money to study those other things. Um, most, of the, most of the money that's available gets thrown at northern spotted owls because they're a listed, federally listed species, and that frees up federal dollars, and in some cases, state dollars to go and study them. In fact, they're required by law to figure out what's going on. So, you know, they spend money to try and figure out what's going on. But for another species that, you know, nobody knows much about, um, there just isn't that much information. You'd think that there'd be tons of information, but, uh, you know, there just isn't for most of these. So that's one thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I just accepted a graduate student, and one of the things that he's interested in is trying to compile a lot of the data that wildlife biologists have from their surveys and try and see if there's any correlation between barred owls and some of these other sm smaller owls. And, um, and, um, you know, and there are quite a few data out there, but no one's had the bandwidth to really pool them together, and, and, uh, and I think folks do have more interest in that. You know, one other thing, while you're queuing up the next question, um, I wanted to mention because because I don't want to imply that that the loss of forests in the West has not been the an issue. It's been a very important issue, and I and I don't think any of the biologists think that barred owls are the problem, not our history of forestry. I think that everyone believes that you know what's happened is that is that the amount of habitat that's available has been restricted to such a small amount, and that habitat that's left has been degraded to a point where it may not sustain a lot of the species and, and you know, northern spotted owl is one and it may have tipped the balance in favor of, of barred owls. And so that's a really important thing too because even if one of the strategies is to try and manage forests and increase habitat values so spotted owls will have the upper hand, you know, we all know that it takes a long time to get a mature redwood forest. 
you know, the kinds of forests that we see along the coasts of California that have 400 year old trees, you know, it takes 200 to 400 years to create those forests. And so even if spotted owls could persist in those forests and beat spotted or beat barred owls, it may take hundreds of years before we have enough of that kind of habitat to, to do that. So, you know, we might still be in a case where we have to do management of barred owls in the interim time until that habitat can be reworked and, and restored. Um, so, I, so I just want to make sure that, that nobody's thinking that, that, you know, we're pointing the finger solely at, at barred owls. It, we're, we're not. I think everyone agrees that the loss of habitat and the degradation of habitat in the West is, is a really key issue. Um, to get back to the other question about other species, I think it's, I think it's really important because we really, in a lot of ways, um, we don't really have our finger on the, on the pulse of a lot of these things. And if you, if you talk to birders who've been around for a long time, you know, for example, um, we all know that uh, Eurasian collared doves are moving in and that they're becoming very common in areas. And you know, folks are like, yeah, but they probably aren't really doing anything. They're, they, they don't seem to be having that much impact. But now that they've been here for a while, birders who've birded for a long time will, will tell you, or at least I've heard many of them say, you know, we just don't see morning doves anymore. Um, and maybe it's because of you know, the Eurasian collar dove, who knows? There's been one published study suggesting that there is a strong correlation, the same kind of correlation. But again, even if people show that correlation, at least at the moment, morning doves aren't listed as endangered. And so there's likely to be no action until it's far too late. And until the Eurasian collar doves are everywhere and having such a huge impact that no one can deny it, but it's too late to do anything about it. And I think that that's, that's one of the critical problems of our system is that you, know, you, you can't act or do anything until the problem gets so bad um, that it, it's, it's obvious that there is a problem and it's probably too late to do anything about it. Thanks, Jack. Um, uh, just remember, folks, if you have questions, use the Q&A. I do see someone with their hand raised. Um, go ahead and put your question in the Q&A. Uh, we do have another question. Why do northern spotted owls tend to nest every year instead of every other year here in Marin County? Um, interestingly, here in Marin County, I think that they do tend to breed a little bit more often. Um, at least the ones that I know of here have have been breeding almost every year. I, I think that there might be a variety of factors and you know I'm I'm not that kind of a field biologist that knows as much about the northern spotted owls up in Oregon and Washington so I, I hate to speak for them but I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest maybe um, that it might just have a lot to do with their prey base coming back. It might also have to do with the weather um, because when it's when it's really wet and cold I think that the owls have a hard time um, breeding so it might be a combination of factors. You might be aware that, you know, the owls and a lot of raptors, um, they have a core area where they breed. And, um, and it's usually a place where the habitat value is really good, where there's a lot of prey easily available. Um, but when they're done breeding and the young have fledged, that prey base is usually pretty depressed in, in the core area. And at that point, the, the owls or the hawks, um, you know, whatever raptor it is you're talking about, will then disperse out to a much larger home range. And they'll, and they'll try and feed in all those other areas and basically let the core recover, if you will. Um, and then they'll wait until the core recovers and then come back and then they'll be like, yeah, now there's enough prey base here that we can basically live in this little teeny tiny corner of our vast empire and, um, and be able to sustain our young in it. While, you know, during that time when, we, when we're really stuck to the nest and we can't move much. So I suspect it just has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, they, they deplete the prey base to such a point where it might take two years for the prey base to recover and that they can stay in that core area. And again, that speaks to the importance of healthy habitat and, and you know, that, that habitat supporting all the prey that they need. Um, apropos of hybridization, has anyone observed a mixed pair nesting? Yes. So um, one of the interesting things about, about hybrids is that you tend to find them when barred owls are still very rare. Um, and so when barred owls are first moving into an area, um, what biologists believe may be happening is that barred owls can't find mates. 
um, but they're able to find, they were able to mate with spotted owls. And oftentimes this might be a male or a female that's unpaired or that's in the matrix that, you know, that can't get its own territory and mate with its own species, but, you know, figures, well, why not? You know, it's better than nothing. Um, he's a little bit weird looking and sings a really weird call, but, you know, let's give it a shot. And, um, and that may be what, what happens. Um, so for example, um, biologists from up north had, had been concerned about hybrids um, when, when barred owls were still rare and concerned about that as an, an impact on spotted owls and that spotted owl genomes might be getting introgressed and watered down, if you will, by barred owls. And so they looked into that and said, oh, that doesn't seem to be a, a, a really big issue. But what we're finding is that, is that you know, and, and then they said, you know, after time, they didn't seem to find hybrids very much. It was just something at the very beginning. But then folks, you know, at Willow Creek and, and Hoopa in Northern California, you know, when, when barred owls were rare, were finding hybrids. And now they don't find nearly as many hybrids. In the Sierras right now, I have colleagues, Zach Peary and his graduate students um, are working up in, the, up in the Sierras around Lassen and down to Tahoe area. And they're finding, almost one third of the barred owls that they're encountering are hybrids. And one, we have, a better, we have a better understanding of what a hybrid looks like and sounds like, so we can diagnose them better in the field now. So that might be helping. But we also, you know, those are areas where barred owls are still in very low density. And so it may just be that they're having a hard time finding other barred owls to, to nest with and they're, they're more than willing to nest with a spotted owl. And then, um, and people have found nests where there's, um, where there's a pair, you know, a spotted owl and a barred owl pairing together. And, um, and colleagues in Oregon have found those, colleagues in, um, in the Hoopa tribal lands have found those. I'm sure there's others, but these are the ones I know the most about. And, um, and Zach Peary and um, John uh, Keene and those folks up in the Sierras have, have found um, hybrid pairings or, yeah. And, um, from what we see, the, the hybrid offspring are viable, and people have even found nests where a hybrid is nesting with a barred owl. Um, and so one of the things that's really interesting to me is where do those, where do those genes go and where do those, what happens to those offspring? Because we don't see that a majority, you know, we don't see that most of these Western barred owls have hybrid ancestry. Um, most of them are pure-blooded um, barred owls. But you know, what happens to those hybrids is, is still pretty unknown, something that we're very interested in. Thanks, Jack. Um, I just wanted to tag on to the question about the nesting every year than every other year. That was great that you answered that. And I also wanted to just add for those of you, maybe you can see it in chat or not, Taylor Ellis, who also works at the park here, uh, chimed in because he studies them and he says there isn't a regular reoccurring pattern but some territories nest more often than others many of them nest more often than not and in consecutive years we've had a couple of years where more owls did not nest like 2007 and 2014 so that was just mm -hmm. kind of some local knowledge there and sometimes taylor actually is a also a guide at our bird festival so uh join us next year maybe taylor will come out and jack as well so we do have just a couple more questions um that i want to get to and um, if you do have questions make sure you get them in and Jack is willing to stay on um, and hopefully you guys will all stay with us uh, for that so let me get to that let's see um, we had one here that said we live near China camp and in Oak Woodland and have several owls including the spotted owl but last week we saw a golden eagle here we are excited about that but worried about the eagle attacking the owl what's the risk Probably not too great because the because they're active at very different times of the day, so I don't I don't think that's um, too much to worry about. Um, that's great. Think, that, actually, that goes to the next question, which was Eastern. I she's heard that Eastern barred owls are active during the day as well as the night. Do they keep the same pattern on the West Coast? And if so, would this allow them a larger prey base and thus overall survival? Um, they are more active during the day, and, uh, and a lot of my colleagues have, have seen them um, fishing and raking around in streams during the day and, um, and foraging during the day. I mean, even spotted owls will do that a little bit during the day, but to a much, much lesser extent. Spotted owls are, are much more night birds, but, but barred owls can be active during the day. And in fact, um, they, 
barred owls um, have been found in Davis. So in the middle of the Central Valley, there's, there's, one, there's one out there that's been calling and it's been detected by eBird and a couple of other places. And um, uh, what, was, what else was I gonna say about daytime activity? Oh, and, and runners in, in parks in Seattle. And I wanna say that I've, I've heard about this in a couple of other areas, but you know, they'll be running um, during the day or you know, maybe in the late afternoon or something and, a, and they get attacked by a barred owl where it'll swoop down and, and hit them or bump into them. Um, so, so barred owls do seem to be um, more aggressive and more active during the day than spotted owls. Great. Um, we have another question. The removal of barred owls is a controversial subject, as you outlined. If a barred owl is found in your woods or plant raised national seashore, would you advocate for killing it before a breeding population is established? Ooh. So, yeah, no, that, that's a really interesting question. And I would say, I would say, I don't think that, um, well, that's a, that's a good question. I think it gets to the heart of the point of the whole talk is that this is something that we all need to be thinking about and, and you know, in wrestling with, is it a good idea? I mean, I'd have to say that at this point, um, it might be something that we should seriously consider because right now the marine population of spotted owls, of northern spotted owls is I think the, one of the only populations that is not in serious decline. And, and, the, and, you know, everyone has, in all the other areas, they've said, yeah, I'm not sure that barred owls are really a big issue. I'm not sure that they're really going to make it. And then they wait and wait and wait. And then before you know it, the barred owls are on this, this trajectory of, you know, going through the roof. And if you're interested in ethical concerns, and I think we all are, you, the best way to handle invasive species is to deal with them when their population sizes are low, because then you're having to remove or kill many, many fewer owls than you would if you wait. And so, so if the question is, you know, do I think that we need to do, um, you know, removal? I, you know, I'm not sure if removal is really the best idea. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know. I think we'd have to look at the data and I think that there's still some data that needs to come in and whether or not it'll even work range wide. But, you know, one thing that we might want to ask ourselves is, you know, Places like the, the Sierra Nevada range, um, you might be able to save the California spotted owl and it might not even cost that many barred owl lives if you act now. If you wait five years, you, you, you might be talking about hundreds of, of barred owls instead of tens. And I think, you know, I'm not sure there's other people in the audience who could probably say more about how many barred owls there are in Marin County, but I, I, the last I heard, there were only about on the order of eight to 10. That's a pretty small number to remove. And, um, and so, you know, I, and if you waited another five or 10 years, you might be talking about, you know, 80 to remove. So one thing that I would pose to everybody in the audience is, you know, if you're, if you're concerned about, you know, the, the ethical issues, um, that would be a reason to, to think about doing this sooner rather than later. The other thing that I'll point out is that there, there is no um, current permitting option for managing barred owls. So you can't get a permit to remove barred owls to manage them. It's not possible right now. Um, but I do think that that might become possible um, after these studies are done and the data is analyzed and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service weighs their options and, and makes recommendations for the future. But owls can be removed for scientific studies and a lot of the removal studies right now are really science-based and they're, they're short-term, you know, three to five-year studies um, and they're, they're to remove owls and, and get important data that they need for doing their modeling, to try and understand population growth, to try and understand dispersal of owls and that's really important for the models to understand, you know, how, how much owls are expected to spread and, um, and how many you would have to remove in order to maintain a population like Marin, for example. That's important because people want to know, well, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about removing 10? Are we talking about removing 10 a year? Or are we talking about, you know, removing hundreds? And, um, and one thing that's interesting is like, you know, that the, the pot, I think the first bird, the first barred owl was seen in Marin around 2002. And so over the last, you know, eight, I guess what, 
year, the population has only gone up to about 10. But now that they're 10, we can expect that to go up a lot faster in the next few years, especially as the populations in Sonoma and Napa get so much larger. Um, so, and if you remove 10 now, you might not have to remove any next year, you know, or maybe only one or two for the next few years. And that might be very different than, you know, if you waited until there were 80, you might be removing 50 a year forever. Um, so, so I guess the short answer is, I don't know. And I think that the ethical issues are very, very important, but it's not as cut and dried as you might think when you first think about it. And, um, and I think that there might be a case for acting, if you're, especially if you're, interest, if you're interested in saving the Northern Spotted Owl, and you're very interested in, in minimizing the numbers of deaths of barred owls, acting early is very important. Okay, um, I only have a couple more questions. We're gonna wrap this up here at three. So we did have a, I think to piggyback just on some of that, will permits be approved soon? We know that BAOW are already being pushed out, spotted owls in Marin. Nesting pair of spotted owls has been pushed out of their terrarium forest mills by a single barred owl. Um, so basically, do you know if the permits will be <clears throat> approved anytime soon is basically what we're getting at. And then I have one more question here. Um, and we just, uh, we have, we're short on time. So this is the last chance to ask questions and kind of get those out there. Otherwise, um, uh, we're going to wrap this up here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think, I, I know that Fish and Wildlife Service is moving in this direction, but I know that it takes a lot of time. So I don't know that there'll be any permits issued soon for management of barred owls. That said, I think that there are a number of people who are interested in, in studying the populations of barred owls that are in Marin County, and I'm one of them. And that might, that might require some removals. I mean, one of the things that I'm really interested in is, you know, are all the spotted, or all, I'm sorry, are all the barred owls that we have in Marin, are they actually just the offspring of the pair that was cranking out babies from Muir Woods from you know, 2002 to um, whenever they disappeared from there? You know, and I don't, I don't know, but that'd be, that would be really important to know, especially if you're, if you're interested in, in management, because if all the birds that are here in Marin are basically the offspring of just that one pair, it means that you could have removed one or both of them many, many years ago and not had to remove any in, that, in the interim time. So I think questions like that are very important to know. And I think that you know, removing some of the owls in Marin County to answer questions like that would be very informative. For instance, um, right now, my colleagues who work up in Sonoma you know, say that Sonoma is, is basically already overrun by barred owls. And, um, and they don't have a whole lot of hope for spotted owls there. Um, but you know, they also said that it, in, in their recollection, there was one pair that settled um, around Guerneville a long time ago and it cranked out young and then Armstrong Redwoods filled up with birds and then the other areas around there filled up with birds. So it's almost like there's, there's one central area that gets settled and it turns out to be a very good breeding area or maybe those, those barred owls are very fecund and very reproductive and then they end up filling things out and so you know studies like that that could be done in Marin would would tell us a lot about how to manage a place like Marin and how many owls would be required to manage it, how many barred owls would be required to be removed to manage a place like Marin and I think studies like that are going to be very important and they'll help inform you know folks who are really concerned about the ethics of long-term management of barred owls and we all should be concerned about that like we need to know like what does this mean how many owls are we talking about removing so and one last thing that i'll, I'll mention is up in up in the hoopa tribe lands um, they're in a situation where there's so much habitat all around them that they're removing you know 50 or more barred owls a year in a 10 mile by 10 mile square and as fast as they're removing them, they're just flowing in from the outside. And Marin may be in a very different situation because there's, there's a lot of habitat around um, the big forest of Marin that's not great habitat for them. And it may just be a matter of removing
shipping one or two every once in a while when they get settled. And, and that's a very different ethical kind of situation than what they're up north. And, um, and, and so, so I do think that, you know, some studies done here in Marin that are carefully done that can inform us about what the management options actually look like can help us make better information when the option becomes available to manage or not to manage. And I think, you know, if the, if the option never becomes available to manage, I do think we're going to see the extinction of spotted owls. And maybe a lot of folks in the audience are okay with that. But I do think that, you know, as birders, I think that we're all interested in something more than just seeing birds at our feeder. We're not happy just seeing um, city pigeons and house sparrows and and starlings in our feeder. We want biodiversity. We want to we want to have a big life list. We want to see a diversity of things, um, doing a diversity of behaviors and a diversity of habitats. And we think that that's all important. And these things have all evolved over a long period of time. And I think most of us would feel like if we lost all those things, we will have lost something very very important. Um, what we're willing to do to save those things is a completely different question. But I do think that it's, it's humans that have created the situation. And I think we have some responsibility ethically to, to consider what it's gonna take to, to fix a lot of the things that we've broken and what's that gonna mean. And I think you know, not fixing them also has its ethical consequences as well. And I think those are the things that we really have to weigh. So on that note, I'll just thank everybody. Sorry that I don't have any answers for you. But I'm hoping that together we can all put our heads together and figure out what what will be the the right thing to do in all this, and um and and even more hopefully I'm hoping that we'll actually do that right thing. So thank you all for joining me and hearing me out and sharing all this amazing research and learning about it. And again, get out there and see these spotted owls because they're amazing critters and um and I don't know how much longer they're going to be around. So thank you very very much.